and I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Uh, as indicated in my announcement of the 14th of January 2014 on East Belfast development proposals and area planning, Orangefield High School will close on the 31st of August 2014. The Belfast Education Library Board is considering a range of options in relation to the future use of this site. Following consideration of these options and engagement with relevant stakeholders, clarification in relation to the future use of the site will be provided by the Board. In the event that a viable alternative is used, Oh, sorry. In the event that a viable alternative use is not identified, the site will be declared surplus and disposed of in accordance with guidance issued by Land and Property Services. Call Mr. Copeland for a supplement. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister for his assessment of any changes that he would have made to the original plan um, in terms of the area planning process and the development? the development proposal process in order to better reflect the needs of the local community? Well, at the end of the day, it is up to the managing authorities, in this case the Belfast Board and the South Eastern Education Library Board were involved in these uh, development proposals. I believe that they should have been brought forward much, further, much earlier, I have to say. And indeed, uh, Orangefield has been left in limbo for a very considerable period of time without any firm decisions being made about its future. And I had to make the unfortunate decision to close it. I believe if interventions had been made earlier uh, by the managing authority, that a different outcome may well have taken place. Uh, in relation to the entirety of the planning process, I have reflected that um, it would have been much use more useful if all the schools in the area had been involved in the discussions and the planning process, uh, regardless of their sector. I think that may have been of huge benefit to the planning. Uh, proposals, but I believe that the decisions I reached on the 14th of January are the correct ones and do give a stable environment for education to be planned on the way forward in that community. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for his update. Uh, the Minister may be aware of uh, significant parental anxiety that has followed his announcement to amalgamate Newton Breda and Knock Breda high schools in south and east Belfast. I could ask the Minister how he would reassure assure those parents uh, of the plans that he has in place in relation to that particular proposal and whether he would be willing to meet with a delegation to listen to concerns in more detail? Um, I believe that if we had have continued with the Knock Breda and Newton Breda as two separate schools, both schools would have suffered as a result. I believe the proposal to amalgamate uh, is the right way forward. I do pick up uh, certain commentary around my proposal to close uh, Newton Breda. However, if more people say that out loud, the more they miss the exact point, and they send out a misconception into the community that the school is closing. The school is reopening under a new guise. The school is going to continue uh, uh, to provide high-quality education to that community and beyond. And I think people should look at the positives on the proposal and the way forward, and not bring this forward as a negative story. Education. Well, provision has been secured in the area post-primary level for generations to come. That's the benefits. I'm more than happy to meet a representative group of parents or representatives from the community to discuss the proposals forward, but I will not be uh, overturning my decision. I will be certainly happy to outline how the decision will be implemented. I call any other uh, supplementary questions. Can I remind members that uh, this, the original question is very site-specific? Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And has already been uh, articulated, the, uh, uh, the Minister will be aware of the enormous anxiety that has been caused at Newton Breda and Knock Breda in relation to this proposal. Uh, our offices have been inundated with people reflecting those concerns. Uh, this might be helpful, and would the Minister take the opportunity now to dispel any notion that the Orangefield site would be used as a new site for either Newton Breda or Knock Breda schools? Can I respectfully suggest that if your offices had, have, before I made a decision, expressed the views and commentary of the people, and indeed uh, expressed concerns about the failure to plan properly for education in that community, it may have been more beneficial than expressing it afterwards. Uh, I, am not, as not, I am not the decision maker in terms of where or if the school will be relocated. I believe that, and I asked the two boards to discuss future provision in the area in much greater detail and decide based on all the evidence before them as to if the school needs to be relocated and where it shall be relocated to. 
I'm not interested in postcodes. I'm not interested in the postal address of any school. I want to ensure that the schools are in the right place to provide education to the young people of the community they are there to serve. Maeve McLaughlin. Gormay and I'll keep my question all site specific. Uh, just in, in relation to the overarching framework, uh, the framework for community asset transfer, can I ask the Minister what uh, work his department have done uh, and around that framework? Gormay um, The Department of Social Development is leading on the programme for commitment to support social enterprise growth within the broader community sector. A key element of this is to develop and implement a policy framework for community asset transfer, uh, and the Social Development Minister did bring a paper before the Executive on the 30th of January uh, in that regard. My department continues to work uh, with my executive colleagues and other executive departments uh, in ensuring that community asset transfer is brought forward, that it is to the benefit of communities, and that where it is appropriate that assets are transferred to community for the betterment of that community. And I call Mr. William Irwin. Question number two, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm always eager to read the, the reports produced by the Education and Training Inspectorate. I am particularly pleased when, as in the case of Market Hill High School, the inspectors recognise and celebrate very good quality educational provision, which is led effectively and results in very good outcomes for the young people in the Market Hill and surrounding rural areas. For supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his reply. Uh, I am aware that there has been ongoing discussion in relation to a new possible school build for Market Hill High School. Can the Minister give an indication as to the possibility of a new school build for Market Hill? Um, I, have been, I have asked the uh, Education and Library Boards and CCMS to bring forward proposals uh, for possible future builds going into the future. I am not in a position uh, to date to announce the outcome of those discussions or indeed any of the proposals the boards or CCMS have brought forward. I hope to be in a position at a latter stage in the spring to bring that announcement forward to the Assembly, but I am not in a position to make any specific comment about Market Hill High School or any other school for that matter. Okay, and I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three. Uh, during the 2013-14 year, $12.4 million was made available for the Extended Schools programme. Work is currently ongoing to finalise budget allocations for 14-15, but I fully intend to maintain, maintaining Extended Schools funding at similar level to 13-14. Looking forward, the budget for education will not be known until the outcome of the 15-16 budget process, which has to be agreed by both the Executive and the Assembly. Any decisions with regard to the level of future extended schools funding will be taken in the context of the 15-16 budget outcome for education. Mr. Spratt, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Will the Minister uh, join with me in recognising the great potential that there is to make greater use uh, of school buildings uh, for community purposes? Uh, and indeed, that can be uh, through the extended uh, school programme as well. Um, I will. I have no hesitation in promoting the greater community use of school buildings. And indeed, only recently, I launched uh, a guidance document along with the decal minister, who was also launching a document in relation to sports clubs and greater uh, linkages between sports clubs and our schools, the state as well. The extended schools programme is an excellent way of doing that, uh, integrating schools greater into the community and drawing parents and others uh, into schools to encourage them to use the school facilities, but also encourage them to become greater involved in their children's education. So I, community use of schools is a program I very much support. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I would thank the Minister for his response so far. Minister, how concerned are you uh, that school principals are being overburdened as a side effect of this worthy policy? Um, well, uh, in the guidance we have set out best practice, and the guidance is there to assist school principals and boards of governors uh, to open up their schools greater to the community. There's a great demand out there for uh, greater access to facilities, and particularly schools after hours, particularly in communities where there are uh, inadequate community facilities. So the guidance sets out in a very simple way as to how schools can and could. 
uh, open up their facilities, it refers to insurance issues, it refers to rental policies, etc. Et so I believe the guidance has taken some of the burden, certainly, off boards of governors and principals. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. You know, the development of parenting skills and the encouragement of parents to get involved in their child's learning was an integral and a very valuable part of the Extended Skills Programme. Minister, have you any plans to um, extend this aspect to all primary schools? Um, the option exists for all primary schools, though I do accept extended schools is directed to those schools in the highest areas of deprivation uh, to assist them in, in, challenge, in tackling the challenges which that deprivation brings to education. But there are many uh, schools outside the extended schools program running programs in relation to relations with parents, communities and expanding, etc. But the current budget restricts me uh, to a certain degree in relation to how much funding I can make available to the extended schools budget and I have no plans at this stage for expanding the eligibility criteria. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. The aim of the review was to ensure that Irish medium education is fully and appropriately supported as an integral part of the education system and contributes to the building of a shared future for all our citizens based on equality. I am pleased to say that the vast majority of the recommendations contained in the review have been fully or very substantially implemented. The, the current position is that of the 24 recommendations, 15 are implemented, with a further seven showing substantial progress. Only two recommendations have not, been, have not made significant progress, but these relate to developing Irish medium primary provision through a federation model. As time has progressed, Educators have been able to develop and share best practice across Irish medium primary provision through less formal structures uh, and ways on a federated model, as originally envisaged in the review. These approaches are, providing, are proving successful in terms of the stated review aim of creating and maintaining sustainable Irish medium primary education. The ongoing implementation of the recommendations continues to contribute greatly to the vibrancy and success of the Irish medium sector at preschool, primary school and post-primary school stages. While significant progress has been made, I am keen to identify where more needs to be done to develop this important area further and to ensure that education in this, in this sector is of the highest quality. Call Mr Bradley for a supplement. And will uh, Sukru or be Janta Ege, uh, Le Genu Kinchide, Gawil and Gail Scullyax and Iru, uh, Nurakurn Arin Policy, Nua Kuntusi, uh, Murata Malta Insan Avretnu, Erin Gail Scullyak? Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. But uh, can I ask the Minister um, if, he has, if there is a process in place within his department? to ensure that any new policy uh, emanating from the department is Irish medium proofed as recommended in the review of Irish medium education. Uh, yes, all policies within my department are, are proofed uh, across the sectors, are approved in particular in relation to Irish medium education and ensure that they are adaptable to and appropriate for the promotion of and facilitation of Irish medium education. And indeed, I think that's one of the reasons why you've seen such a dramatic rise in the numbers of young people uh, attending Irish medium provision. Uh, the level has risen since from 2,685 in 2002 03 to 4,627 in 2012-13. So there has been a dramatic rise in young people uh, attending Irish medium provision. We have supported that development both through financial, direct financial resources and through resources uh, in relation to the teaching of the curriculum and provision around the curriculum. Uh, we engage, as I do with all sectors, on a regular basis with the Irish medium sector and continue discussions as to how we can further uh, support and facilitate that sector. You and Ms. Rosie McCorley for a supplementary. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. And Dick Leshenaira, Sunria Horch, or Faski, Elijicus, Leblint, Debogonus. Can the Minister detail, please, the growth of Irish medium education over recent years? Gormayogut. 
Bone Break Isolation Valat as in case. There has been a dramatic rise in relation to Irish medium education over recent years, and as I outlined to uh, Mr. Bradley, we have seen a rise from 2002 3 of 2,685 pupils to 4,627 in 12 13. Uh, the, there are now 29 standalone Irish medium schools, 28 primary and one post primary, 10 Irish medium units attached to Catholic maintained schools, 7 primary and 3 post primary. In relation to capital investment in the Irish medium sector since 2009, DE has spent just over 7.6 million. In addition, new school projects in the Irish medium sector, which I announced on the 25th of June 2012, are college to first year, 11.9 million. Bond School Ben Monaghan, 2.5 million. A further two Irish medium projects were announced in my January 22nd uh, announcement of 13, and these are at an early stage of progression. So the department continues to react to the growth of the Irish medium sector. We will continue to carry out our statutory duties in relation to the Irish medium sector and to continue to engage with the Irish medium sector in relation to our statutory duties uh, to facilitate and promote the Irish medium education. Comes to Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, uh, give, given that the Irish medium and the integrated sectors were both referenced in the Good Friday Agreement, and that his department has the same obligation under statute to encourage and facilitate both movements, would he consider a review of the integrated system, and similar to the one that's been talked about today? I have set out in previous responses and correspondence and indeed statements in the Assembly my obligations and indeed my work around facilitating and promoting uh, integrated education. I have not been asked in the past to carry a, out a review in relation to integrated education to see if that will facilitate the advancement of it, though it's something I am happy to take under consideration and have further discussions with both the member uh, and uh, supporters of the integrated sector about. You and I call Mr. Barry Michael Duff. Uh, question number five, Cash de Verkuig. I have noted the recent Council of Europe report on the implementation of the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. My department is considering the references to education here in the north of Ireland and looking at what actions we can take to ensure that we are meeting our obligations under the Charter. My department has made a great deal of progress in the area already. For example, the Irish Medium Education Review, which I have just mentioned, aims to ensure that Irish medium education is fully and appropriately supported as an integral part of the education system. Schools can teach Irish and also Scots language, literature, culture and history at both primary and post-primary level. My de department has provided funding for the production of teaching resources for both Irish and also Scots languages. The development of special educational needs provision for Irish medium education. An advisory group on the strategic development of Irish medium post-primary education. An Irish medium education early year specialist post and ultram. The community relations equality and diversity in education policy a Department of Education Languages policy for Irish, which sets out the administrative services that my department currently offers in Irish and informs those who wish to use Irish how they may communicate with the department through the Irish language. Thank you. Barry McElduff for a supplement. Can I ask the Minister uh, to outline perhaps what additional duties or obligations this places on him as a Minister? Uh, essentially to develop the point he made about how it specifically impacts on education? Uh, thank you, Member. As the Member will know, and, and I have responded to the previous questions, there is an obligation to us on relation to uh, the 98 Act, in relation to the European Charter for Regional Languages. Part 2 of the Charter sets out high-level objectives and principles pursued in support of regional and minority languages. Here, that applies to in both parts to Irish and Ulster Scots. Part 3 lists more specific measures that must be taken to promote the use of regional or minority languages in public life. Here this currently applies only to Irish. Part 3, DE has either specific responsibility or collective responsibility with under, other departments, Article 8, Education and Article 10, Administrative Authorities and Public Services. So there is obligations placed upon us by the Charter uh, in relation to the promotion of minority uh, and regional languages, and it's something that my department takes very seriously. Mr. William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware, in terms of the, the, the current funding and resource issue that his department has in relation to the Ulster Scotsy Agency. Given what he has just said, what extra resource will the Minister put into the uh, education system 
and, and the, the sectors across uh, Northern Ireland to pr promote Ulster Scots in terms of education. And indeed, can I ask the Minister, in terms of the ongoing disparity that there is in terms of funding between Irish and Ulster Scots, uh, what more can he make available to help address that issue? Uh, my, my department funds on the basis of need. Uh, the member will be aware, and I've, I've answered in previous questions, we have a thriving Irish medium sector. Uh, we have over 4,000 children uh, currently being taught through the medium of Irish, uh, and it continues to grow. We have over 20 um, Pacific either units or schools in relation to the Irish medium. I unfortunately do not have any in relation to Ulster Scots. I do make funding available uh, for the promotion of Ulster Scots material, and I have engaged with the Ulster Scots agency. I asked them to come back to me uh, with further details of support. I await that response, but I'm happy to engage with anyone who's promoting Ulster Scots to see how I and, and, the, and they work closer together to promote uh, either it's the Ulster Scots language or the Ulster Scots culture. I have a phobia of neither. Ms. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answers? But given his party president's statement in 2003 that the language is still central to our political project, how is he, as Education Minister for All Children, depoliticising the Irish language? Um, the member spends more time studying my party leader's speeches than I do, so I don't know if, in what context the party leader said that or where the party leader said that, but you keep studying the speeches anyhow. Uh, the Irish language has been politicised not by those who advocate it, not by those who wish to speak it, not by those who wish to learn it, not by those who wish to respect it. It has been politicised by those who wish to prevent it being spoken, prevent it being learnt, prevent it being used, and prevent it ever, uh, its identity ever being uh, acknowledged. I am currently learning Irish because I believe that it is part of what I am, who I am. Many other people learn it because they believe it's part of what they are and who they are, etc. But it does not belong to me, it does not belong to my party, it does not belong to my political beliefs. It belongs to everyone on the island of Ireland, regardless of their political affiliations or none, regardless of their religious affiliations or none. And the best way, in your terms, to depoliticise it is for people to respect it for what it is, a language, and for everyone to take ownership of it, and then no one can claim ownership of it. I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. I would like to, to thank uh, <coughs> the Minister and uh, support him fully in what he's just after saying in regard to the Irish language. It's there for everyone. It belongs to no one or no section of the community in particular. It's there to gain understanding and understanding of our history, our background, and indeed our environment. Uh, so, just the Hakarash Higgin case, modulation to a tourist call in Europe. I guess, while I'm Isla Mach, on Ira, a div Kabetaja Tajant that last Eden ran, modulation tourist, I guess, Mas Feder, Lesson Ira. And Tolishin arrange linea gopibli. I would like to find out in regard to the recent Council of Europe report uh, what analysis has been done by the department in regard to it, and if that analysis could be made available publicly to the rest of us to, to have a look at it by his department. Uh, I have asked my uh, officials to study the report and to report back to me on the findings of that report. Uh, I have been concerned by certain media uh, reports around it, uh, highlighting uh, alleged feelings by my department in relation to education, or, or alleged feelings in relation to our promotion and facilitation of Irish media. And I certainly want to clear those matters up. Where there are feelings, we need to deal with those, uh, and we need to correct them, and we need to move on and ensure uh, that they do not happen again. But once I have asked my department has completed the review of the report, I'm more than happy uh, to publish that. Uh, and to share that with members of the Assembly. Here, and I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Question number six, Principal Deputy Speaker. Through the implementation of Count Read Succeed, the, numeracy, the Literacy and Numeracy Strategy, the aim is to raise standards and close achievement gaps. The strategy sets out the central role of teachers, supported by parents and school leaders, in their work to raise standards. Improvements have been made at Key Stage 2, GCSE, and A Level. 
However, we have still too many young people who are underachieving. Funding has been allocated to specific programmes to further improve outcomes in literacy and numeracy in socially disadvantaged areas. These include the Delivering Social Change programme to employ additional teachers, a community education initiative programme, a literacy and numeracy CPD key stage two uh, to three project, and a special educational needs CPD literacy project for primary schools. I have also provided additional funding for area learning communities to increase the capability within post-primary schools to improve literacy and numeracy levels amongst disadvantaged pupils. The ATI is engaging with a number of post-primary schools in a programme to raise standards in English and mathematics. There is also an important role for parents and local communities in addressing educational achievement. The Education Works Advertising campaign is aimed at informing and reminding parents of the importance and value of becoming more involved in their child's education. Both the Community Education Initiative Programme and the Extended Schools Programme have a focus on positive educational outcomes. I call Mr Dixon for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Given that uh, often literacy and uh, numeracy issues in uh, communities of high deprivation are intergenerational issues, what specifically is the Minister doing with other ministerial colleagues to address those intergenerational issues uh, where children uh, uh, unfortunately, are not supported sufficiently by parents. Well, uh, during my original uh, answer, I, I referred to the Delivering Social Change Programme, which is a subcommittee of the executive, and I have managed to secure funding through that from, uh, in coordination and collaboration with OFM DFM in relation to the appointment of numeracy and literacy teachers to schools, around 273 uh, recently qualified uh, Teachers have now been appointed to both post-primary and primary schools, and that has been proving very successful. I also have engaged with, uh, sponsored a programme along with the DSD minister in relation to nurture units uh, in primary schools, and there's a number of other initiatives I am currently looking at in conjunction with my ministerial colleagues. And indeed, I have reported to the assembly previously. I work quite closely with the health minister in a number of the programmes he has developed, uh, and in turns in working with. Uh, young mothers and their families about creating an educational environment within the home. So I think there's a lot of work going on. Of course, if we had greater budgets across the executive, we would like to do much more work, but I, I am satisfied with the level of cooperation thus far. And I call Mr. George Robinson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister, given the work of learning communities such as you will see in your next visit to Luma Valley later this week. How important is the work of learning communities in improving literacy and numeracy? Uh, I was wondering how you were going to get your constituency into this one. Fair play to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, area learning communities have proven uh, very valuable in sharing uh, skills bases and knowledges between schools about how to tackle the, uh, the issue of numeracy and literacy and sharing the, the, the best practice and the advantages. Uh, that, that brings. So I have provided funding specifically to the area learning communities to develop projects around numeracy and literacy, and they have proven very successful. I would like to see the area learning communities develop their work further, to develop their collaboration further. And when we do come to finalising the budgets uh, going into the next CSR for 15-16, I, I would be keen to ensure that area learning communities are continue to be funded in such a manner. Sir Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And given the large um, amount of initiatives that are going forward on illiteracy and in numeracy, if we were to go for absolutely no one, for zero, to, have, uh, to be illiterate or enumerate, has the Department a process for annually knowing how many people are illiterate or enumerate? Well, we, we have regular assessments within our school system. Uh, uh, and we are trying to improve on that better through the levels of progression as to see how our young people are progressing through the school system and to ensure that their needs are being met. But the, the nature of this issue is that problems should and can be identified uh, in nursery school, should and can be identified in primary school, and should be dealt with through that phase of education. I think it's regrettable that any young person reaches post-primary school and their numeracy and literacy deficit has not been recognised, has not been uh, aided, and there has been no scheme put in place to assist that child.
But I believe that the systems we have put in play uh, are continuing to ensure that young people's lives, more and more young people's lives, are not being blighted by uh, an absence of numeracy and literacy. But I believe that we do have to improve the measurement of that. As you say, can we, at any one given time of the year, express how many children uh, are below the levels we were concerned about? I believe that if we could make progress in levels of, new, or levels of progression, we would be able to achieve that goal. Call Mr. Chris Hazard. Can I ask the Minister to detail the level of additional funding targeted at numeracy and literacy projects in recent years? Um, delivering social change, improving literacy and numeracy has 15.56 million uh, added to that. The community education initiatives have 2 million over the next two years. Literacy and numeracy CPD key stage 2 3 project uh, is 2 million over two academic years. Um, the post primary sector, an additional half a million per annum over the three years to further support area learning communities. So there are substantial additional amounts of money being placed uh, to tackle numeracy and literacy, but the core function uh, of educational funding is to improve numeracy and literacy. So everything we, we fund surely has to be about improving uh, a child's numeracy and literacy skills. Order, and that ends the period for oral questions, and we'll now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, I could I ask the Minister for a progress update in relation to the planned new build for Holy Trinity Secondary School in Cookstown? I go for Val Following representations from CCMS, the Department's area planning team has confirmed that it is reasonable to proceed in planning based on a 1,300 pupil school. This increase in enrolment is subject to an approved development proposal. CCMS has indicated that DP will issue for consultation uh, such a proposal next month. The Department is scheduled to meet with the school on the 10th of February to commence work on an economic appraisal uh, with the help from expert resources secured from SEIB. Thanks very much to the Minister for that response. Um, has the Minister got any projected date in mind as to when the tenders might issue for this project? I have no fixed date in mind as to when the tenders should uh, issue for this project. It will depend in relation to the work on the economic appraisal. Uh, I would like to see the economic appraisal work go through as quickly as possible because I am keen uh, not only to get the schools built, but I'm also keen to get money out the door and into our economy uh, and, and the infrastructure uh, around that. But that, that's, we, we have to cross each hurdle as it presents itself. The economic appraisal is the next hurdle. And as I say, my officials are meeting with the school on the 10th of February. And I call Mr. Phil Flanning. Can I ask the, the Minister for an update on his delib deliberations on the um, reform of the funding formula for schools? Um, I am at a very advanced stage in relation to those deliberations. I hope to be in a position to share the consultation responses with, I'll see the charge left, uh, the consultation responses with the Education Committee this week. Um, as the member will be aware, there was around 15,000 uh, consultation responses, which took a considerable amount of time to work our way through, but we have done that now. Uh, I also have to consult with a body known as LMS, which is a, a, the employing authorities uh, in relation to schools, and I, that meeting is scheduled to take place on Wednesday. I hope my officials are in a position to meet with the Education Committee next Wednesday, and thereafter a decision can be made. Again for supplement. A free or last and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can the Minister outline how any additional funds will impact on educational attainment outcomes? My primary objective throughout this process has been to ensure that we direct our resources as to where, they will have the, the mo where the most need exists and where they will have the most impact. Time and time again, um, we are shown that social deprivation is closely linked to educational underattainment. Therefore, we have to tackle it. And if we wish to create a more just and equal society, if we want to give everyone an equal chance in life, as is set out in the programme for government, then we have to direct our resources to do that. I have had the opportunity to inject the 15.8 million additional funds which would not have been recorded on the schools' budgets which they received earlier in the year and caused 
under, understandable concern. I have had the opportunity to do that, and I believe I am now in a position where I can confirm that no school will lose any funding as a result of the changes I have made. That where I have to place and put in place a consent, contingency fund, I will do so to ensure that no school uh, loses out uh, in the first year of the funding round, and I am confident that the losses have been reduced substantially to any school that would lose funds thereafter. Thank you. And I call Ms. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that the Education and Library Boards are increasingly under pressure to deliver policy with decreasing numbers of staff, and this is having a negative impact on schools. Can the Minister give reassurance that he is actively reviewing the situation, especially with regards to the vacancy control policy in place since 2006? Um, well, the, the best way to review this matter is to make ESA work and to bring ESA uh, forward. I have a paper with the executive from April 2013 seeking agreement uh, on the movement of ESA, and there has been none. So the best way to give certainty to education and library boards and to education staff is to bring that policy forward. However, I, I can no longer continue on a basis of uncertainty uh, in relation to those staff. I think it is only right and proper that if we place, as you demands, expectations uh, upon our staff that they are in a position where they are motivated to do so, where they believe that they are being valued by uh, both myself as Minister, the Department, and uh, by their employers. And I have committed uh, to review vacancy control. I have committed to review um, the numbers of staff currently working in the boards and to work with the, the Education and Library Boards to ensure that going into the future that they are adequately staffed and those staff that have been affected by vacancy control are dealt with in a proper manner. Ms. Hale for supplementary. Um, can the Minister tell us, with the denuding of the CAS service and the consequential lack of input across all of our schools, will the Minister review this service in terms of personnel available, and will he inform us of the outcome of the recent meetings he had with the Association of the ELBs? Um, I have largely have informed you in my previous answer about my <laughs> a recent meeting with the Association of Education and Library Boards. I informed the boards that I was prepared to take a look at vacancy control. I was prepared to take a look at the impact of redundancies upon the boards uh, and that we did have to take measures and uh, significant measures to shore up the boards as a result of the failure of the executive to deliver ESA. In relation to CAS, CAS will be included in those discussions. I want to ensure that we have support networks in place for our schools and that uh, adequate support networks are in place for our schools to ensure that our teachers and schools have every support they have available. But there also has to be minded here there's going to be substantial investment required. Um, substantial investment has already taken place in the terms of letting 400 staff go from the boards. Uh, reducing um, senior management within the boards. That's all public money that has been spent. I may now be standing on the brink of having to spend more money rehiring staff, uh, reconstituting the boards in terms of their senior management, bec all because we, the executive has failed to agree ESA. Uh, and I think that's very, very disappointing. But we cannot continue the way we are. Our boards cannot function in their current uh, status. Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister to provide uh, an update in relation to the amalgamation of Knock uh, Breda and Newton Breda High Schools? Um, as the Member will be aware, I made an announcement in the House on the 14th of January. As for the amalgamation to take place, I believe, by uh, August 2014 or there afterwards, as soon as there possible there afterwards. Uh, the board and boards are now currently working on making that proposal a reality. Spratt for supplementary. Uh, can I uh, thank the Minister for his uh, very brief answer uh, in relation to the thing, but can I ask the Minister uh, to assure me uh, and assure the parents of those pupils that are going to be affected uh, by this amalgamation that they will receive the highest standard of education and that there, there will be uh, they will not be disadvantaged by any of the necessary changes, given that many of those pupils will be affected for the entirety of their secondary education. Um, I have no difficulty in giving the member assurances for that, and the reason why I made the decision 
uh, to amalgamate both schools was to ensure that uh, high quality educational provision was and continued to be provided uh, in that area. I believe my decision was the right one. I understand the member has an adjournment debate down for discussion in the next number of weeks. I know and I've already agreed to meet with the member uh, to discuss the matter in more detail. The operational process of this is for uh, the South East Education and Library Board. Uh, my department is in close liaison with them in regards to this matter. And I can assure the member that my department stands ready to give any further assistance required to assure that we have a smooth, a smooth uh, transition uh, to the new amalgamated school. I call Mr. David Hildich. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. In, in, in answer to a previous question, I think it was from Mr. Spratt, you indicated, Minister, that you had launched a, a joint strategy with the DECAL Minister in relation to shared access. Uh, can you indicate, are you content, or, or what level of progress has actually been made on sort of shared access to the school estate and facilities by local community groups and sports clubs? Um, well, in fairness, we, we, we only launched the strategy uh, several weeks ago. And when mine was for the community use of schools, the decal ministers was in relation to sports clubs, etc. But there was uh, a commonality between them. I, I think uh, we will come back to it within a year. We will go back to schools tr and take a survey of what schools have taken the opportunity to open up their facilities to greater community use. At the end of the day, it is a decision for the Board of Governors. Uh, in previous discussions with schools, concerns were raised around issues around insurance. Uh, around rental policies, etc., access to the school afterwards. And through the strategy we have issued, we give case examples of that. We set out how, they, how those hurdles can be overcome, uh, and as the high schools can reassure themselves and not place themselves in any further liable, uh, liability in relation to insurance, etc. Uh, so I believe schools can and should open up their facilities uh, to greater community use. I want to see how this policy develops before uh, changing course and direction. As I said, it's only out a number of weeks. Held it for a supplementary. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. do, do thank the Minister for his answer. And he, he certainly has touched upon it again. And, and, and while there are some successful partnerships out there, uh, would the Minister acknowledge that there remains to be some work and maybe indeed a substantial piece of work to be done to encourage some within the sector uh, to support the strategy? Well, I think it only stands to the benefits of the individual schools. Uh, schools need to be part of the community. They need to be accessible uh, greater than from half eight on or until four o'clock in the evening. The, the people need to have ownership of their school, uh, who are living around it, whether they attend the school or not. Uh, but if you're looking to encourage uh, pupils to attend your school, if you're looking to encourage ownership of your school, if you're looking to, to encourage a community uh, value of, of your school, the best way to do that is to open your doors, allow local sports clubs in, allow local youth clubs in, uh, whether it are uh, pensioners clubs, whatever it may be that's happening in your community and they need a room to go into in the evening, why should it not be in the local school? There are all the barriers that were once there, I believe we have dealt with in our, in our current policy and I would encourage schools to read it closely and if they have any questions, come back to my department and we will clarify them for them. I beg your pardon. And Ms. Mickey Brady. Gorham, I got the pre last concordia. Uh, could I ask the Minister what support has the Department put in place to assist the teacher at the boys' model, who has been the target of sectarian intimidation because we're old as a Sinn Féin councillor? Gorham, I got. Well, I, I think the most important support thus far given to the teacher has been from pupils at the school. I have to say it's commendable uh, the courage and vision many of the pupils have shown in their public pronouncements through social media sites in relation to their views around, and it has to be said, a very, very small minority of people who are running a hate campaign uh, against the teacher. I welcome the fact that, even though belatedly, that all of, uh, majority, if not all, of our, our, our political parties have now come out uh, and condemned the intimidation. I welcome the fact from community leaders and community groups within the area who have come out and condemned the intimidation and want to see only the best for the young people in the boys' model moving forward. In relation to your specific question, uh, I understand that the Education and Library Boards have been meeting with both the Board of Governors, trade union representatives, and may at this stage uh, have met with uh, the teacher herself to discuss the way forward. Well, Mickey Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And does the Minister agree that there is an incredible irony at objections to a Sinn Féin councillor 
working as a teacher in a state school, and successive Sinn Féin members, ministers have put substantial investment into state schools, including the boys' model, investments which have improved the quality of life and made the prospects much better for many Protestant children. Graham Eggert. Well, I think it's worth remembering that the objections came from, with, from outside the school, came from outside the pupils, came from outside uh, the other teaching staff in the school. And those who made the objections clearly need to be educated in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, because I certainly will stand by my record in terms of support uh, for Protestant working class communities in terms of education. I know my predecessors can stand by their record in terms of support for education within Protestant working class communities. And I believe as, as we move forward, <coughs> and, and indeed um, we see the outcome and the results of the common funding formula, it will be shown that where there is need, uh, we will support it. We will not judge it on the basis of creed, we will support it on the basis of need. Thank you. And uh, time is up. That concludes question time.